I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Richard LePan, better known as Rich LePan. Rich received his doctorate with distinction from the University of Utah. He was at the University of Missouri at Columbia, and then he went to be department chair at the University of Massachusetts. Being department chair did not affect his productivity because Rich has continued to be a renowned scholar in the vocational area and the school counseling area. <laughs> I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Um, instrumental in developing, Rich has been instrumental in developing C-Score, which is the Center for School Counseling Outcome Research and Evaluation. He has extensive experience in working with schools. I was hoping to get something juicy here to introduce um, Rich for, so I asked him if there were any skeletons in his closet, and reluctantly he said no. So I'm um, a little embarrassed to say I don't have any juicy information about Rich, but I'm sure his presentation is going to be very informative, and I look forward to it, so thank you. Well, it's uh, very nice to be here, uh, and it's a delight to uh, be able to spend a few minutes and talk with you something that I'm very passionate about, and it's nice to be with like-minded colleagues that you can have uh, good, honest intellectual debates and wrestle with some of these issues. Um, however, I did say to Sue uh, Whiston that I, I do have one skeleton in my closet that I'm willing to share, and that uh, um, I have found myself at times in difficult, heated uh, debates around research and uh, suggesting that my work uh, may have something to say. And when I'm really challenged, I turn around and say, well, you know, Sue Whiston has found the same thing. <laughs> and people tend to back off at that point. So. <laughs> I would highly recommend that. Uh, I would like to take a minute, though, and thank Scott and Kimberly. And is Marion here? But all the work that, uh, thank you very much for putting on this conference. And welcome to Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Very, very much. Uh, and uh, since Scott announced that he was going to be coming to Massachusetts, we've had a Category 3 uh, uh, tornado. Uh, we've had a hurricane. We've had an earthquake. And then a, s a snowstorm that shut the East Coast down. I'm uh, hoping <laughs> next year, maybe. <laughs> and he's already testified in front of the Massachusetts legislatures around um, uh, the, the e-portfolio and the individualized learning plans. So we're expecting great things. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And last, before I get started, I'd like to thank you. Um, you know, I have, I have learned from you and benefited from you and continue to learn from you, and so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, you've made a big difference in my life professionally as well as personally, so thank you, uh, I, I think. So, uh, I always wanted to do uh, meaningful work and be associated with good people doing that, so I, I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling good about, about this. Good. Um, I am going to read you three sentences that I wrote, though, um, uh, and and because I uh, these are things that I believe in, uh, and this is you'll find this in your program um, uh, guide. It said, and, and I wrote this for my uh, proposal. I said career guidance activities can play a unique, value-added role in helping all young people to become ready, gain access, and succeed in self-chosen post-secondary college and career futures. This is especially true for traditionally underserved populations who are now facing increasing risk factors associated with growing poverty in the United States. This presentation will make the case that enough credible research evidence exists right now to establish national policies that bring the benefits of college and career counseling services to all pre-kindergarten through grade 13 youth. I, I believe that. I, I would like to see a show of hands. How many of you believe that, too? I, I think we need to fight for this. And, and, and quite honestly, and, and I, could, I could randomly go around the room and do this, but I was thinking, okay, I'm a basketball fan. You give me Bluestein, Steve Brown, Joe Ida Hansen, and Bob Lent, uh, and this afternoon we'll have a better national policy than we've had in the last 30 years. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I, I, we could put that to the test. Okay. So, um, uh, so I'm going to I'm do a couple of things, but uh, I really want to show you some data. So I'm I'm going to kind of I'm going to move to that. And immediately, Steve Brown starts shaking his head. Yes, so quick, get to the data. <laughs> <laughs> Could you put the cameras on Steve over there? <laughs> uh, but I do want to say I'm going to give you a very distorted view of national policy, at least the, the one way I look at it. And I don't claim any objectivity to this. Um, and secondly, we're going to talk about results. We're talking about good people. Uh, and an, having an organized approach, and as I say to school counselors, you're condemned to find results. 
you, you, you will find all kinds of positive outcomes as a consequence of that. And I do think the career guidance, uh, however we want to title that, will, will lead to some very, very good things. And I also came to career guidance from working with kids with serious emotional problems. I ran a group home, did a lot of work with DOIS, and I always found the best way to reach them was not through a pathology approach, but was engaging, hooking them up about positive futures and how to go. That's how, actually, that's how I came to the career area. Okay, um, and then I want to hit on collaboration because boy, we've got some problems around collaboration, particularly with our associations. I think so. I think we're, I'd like to hit that one. Okay, but uh, lest we, um, you know, let, think about. Let's not forget why we're doing this work. Uh, this is. Um, you, I think you should see this on your handout. This is a young woman, a fourth grader, a Latina woman. Uh, and, um, and she was participating in an after-school program. You know, she goes to school probably about 7 in the morning and gets home probably 5 or 6 at night. So she's in this after-school program. And uh, one of our counselors was running these groups, and so she, she did a little, uh, we'd like to do the pre-post as well, uh, John, uh, um, around. And she said, I'm proud of myself because I have, a good, I have good grades. Uh, I have a great mother. I like my teachers. Uh, what have I learned from this group? Not to be a bully. Uh, I want to go to college because... And she said, I want to go to college because I want to be a surgeon, and I think that if I keep getting good grades, I could get into college and earn some money. And, I, and it's interesting how young, high aspirations start. And the challenge we have is how do we create a system that helps her to realize these high aspirations? Okay. And in fact, in her, in her school district right now, there is not a system that does this. There are, there, are, there are no portfolios. I mean, this is, a, this is a critical, let me give you some facts about th the third graders in her school. 90% of the third graders in her school do not reach proficiency on the MCAS reading test. So that's like, it's like here's my, this is my higher order math for the day. Nine out of every 10 kids in that third grade can't meet proficiency on our MCAS reading. That's pro I mean, that's a huge predictor of what's going on down the road. For, for them. 50% of the Hispanic kids in this school, which is predominantly Hispanic at this point, don't graduate uh, in five years. 50%, it's actually 48%. And actually it's worse than that because the hidden secret is that they don't track the kids who are eighth graders who never show up as ninth graders. They don't, so, so it's actually way worse. So it's probably more like 40% or lower. Okay. These, this is a huge, huge issue for us. Um, and so you might want to say, well, what does our policy uh, have to do with national policy helping us to build a system that would help this young woman reach her high aspirations? And so um, I'm going to give you a quick tour from 1980s to the present. Uh, who remembers this? If we were going to go, let's send our best. Anybody remember what that, who said that? Ronald Reagan. And you know what was it about? Funding for the MX missile. Okay, okay, and at that, right in that same period, we also then had funding cuts for career education programs that Ed Herr had talked about. How many have had the experience of, if you think you've had a good idea, Ed Herr probably wrote two papers on it by 1975. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's why I don't read his work. It's, it's too humbling. It's too humbling. Uh, but this, so this idea that, you know, the, you know, how do we put career education themes into uh, our education? And our keynote speaker um, did a great job of, and I asked you the question, are we, is it too, and you're not worried at all about limiting and starting early because it doesn't narrow. And, 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 and. But this idea started to come online. I had the good fortune of hearing Paul Barton talk about this. And you all know Ken Hoyt. Somebody said the other day, what happened to Ken Hoyt? You know, and, you know, he did great things for us. His programs got funded, got cut, and there was good research that was beginning to emerge that it had an, out, it had an impact. They were finding the same, many of the same kinds of things that I've heard, heard you all talking about. Um, so, so then, the Student work, School to Work Opportunities Act. I mean, how many of you were involved with that? That's where I started to meet David and Scott, and that's right. We all, you know, kind of started coming together. Fun, that was sunsetted legislation, right, to, to develop community career partnerships, five years. Okay, um, do you think that was a success or a failure? Uh, think, think about that for a minute, but that went away. Followed by No Child Left Behind kind of comes on the scene. Uh, and at the time in Missouri, it became more and more difficult to get counselors to develop work-based learning, uh, connecting activities, the very things we're talking about. Why? Because the, the principals were saying, 
I'm being, we're being held to uh, these accountability tests. I mean, I had counselors saying that they were going to get fired if they had uh, one, one counselor said, geez, Rich, we, you, didn't, you didn't give us a course on this in our graduate program. Um, you know, we had 1,200 kids, and I, I had like uh, 1,100, 999. I, I lost a test somewhere, and the principal said I was going to get fired for it because everybody was so freaked out about it. I talked to one counselor during that time period and saying, I'd like to come up and talk with you about uh, this, and maybe you know, a student that's up in, in, and he said, oh, no, 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 I can't. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, I've got to sit here and watch the tests. And I said, what are you talking about, sit here and watch the tests? Well, his job for the day was to sit in a room with the door closed and watch the test that they were so worried about. So, so much of our obsession and fixation. In Chicago, um, I'll show you some data in a minute, um, some, some of the counselors, they drive the um, tests over to the, and I'm not, I like tests in some ways, I'm not rant, but it's this, you know, the craziness of what we've moved ourselves into. Um, you know, they'll drive the tests actually to the, just to the place where they're being dropped off. So instead of spending a day working with kids on e-portfolios or whatever the strategies we're talking about, they're doing a whole range of other kinds of things. And, and so uh, I think what Jim was talking about is directly applicable to what's going on in public schools and how we need to liberate our counselors to do evidence-based and effective practices. Um, in Massachusetts, a very great thing happened. We got, in, um, counselors are written into a race to the top, Project 4C, and we've got 46 districts now that are effectively implementing the Massachusetts model for comprehensive counseling, which is based on the ASCA model, which in, quite honestly is a counseling psychology model uh, that's taken down to the K through 12. I mean, uh, I did my internship at the uh, counseling center uh, at the University of Utah and uh, developmental preventative approach taught classes. Uh, I never saw the, the, the distinction or the conflict between working in K through 12 schools or being, uh, as Jim was saying, at, uh, at, a, at a college uh, counseling center or career center. Um, so this whole thing, and I, I do want to make a pitch for getting behind a comprehensive program idea because it's, an, it's a possibility of bringing it to scale and sustainability across schools. And, 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 and a good way, uh, and it's something that will actually, I keep saying to people, if we change the mass model along the college and career readiness lines that we know was works, when the money runs out, we're going to have a fully sustainable program. And, and, and things will be different in our schools. Well, at least that, that's the hope. But of course, now back uh, to 1992. Um, so <laughs> I was reading a report. Uh, somebody, um, a Harvard Graduate School of Ed, uh, came out with a report, and I was reading it, and and I was saying, it's like, oh, I felt like I'm just woken up, and it's 1992 again because of what they're talking about. It, it felt like this is what we were talking about before the School to Work Opportunities Act started. The things that uh, you were all talking about, connecting activities, work-based learning uh, opportunities. Because the issue is. Uh, and you know, it's like, well, every, the first reaction is, well, all this emphasis on college, what about career? So now we're going to swing back over and start, you know, you know so, and I, and I think my uh, take on it is, well, what's next? And I think what's next is depends on who wins the election. Because, and that's how we seem to do business in the United States. We have fits and starts. So I'm going to make a case for staying the course. Uh, grounding it in good research practice, doing the research to improve those practices and saying, nope, we're going to, you know, and, and that's uh, actually one thing uh, Norm Geisper's talking me about, you know, staying on target and, and moving forward that way. Okay. Um, lest we forget, and I'm going to be careful because I know um, it's, this time is quickly uh, evaporating, um, but you all go back and look at the um, report to Congress that Mathematica did. Uh, Joe, have you all seen this, the, their findings on the outcomes for the School to Work Opportunities Act? Um, uh, the, the, one of the speakers yesterday was talking about how they actually threw the data away and when the Bush administration came in, they cut the funding for the student level data because they had collected data on students all across the United States as a result. But some of the things they found was that participation of non-college bound students in classes related to their career goals had nearly doubled since 1996. Women, especially African American women, were more likely to participate in school related workplace experiences, and, which they valued, and that participation in classes students saw as being related to their career interests was increasing, especially in schools that had a large African American student populations. This goes back to um, uh, to, to your point, uh, student options were being expanded, not narrowed. So that, you know, very much a 
you know, the American ethos we have about, oh, you, you know, you don't want to, uh, you know, move too quickly or to dictate. But in fact, ki kids who were going to four-year colleges wanted these experiences as much as kids who were going into apprenticeship programs. This is a natural, inherently interesting activity to do. But what they warned about was integrating a career focus was coming under, char uh, under threat at that point, and that's where we moved into No Child Left Behind. So I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, hit you with some some data here. Um, people plus program equals results, and unfortunately, I think whatever you want to call it, let's say career guidance. Um, if I was, if we're being honest with it about it, with the situation in our schools, one term that I think about is that we have a highly variable standard of care. I mean, there are some schools. I said was saying that you could take any one of my daughters and say any of those counselors would be fine. But you can go to another school, and I would say uh, there's not a way in the world I would let one of them work with my kid. And, I, and unfortunately, I mean, I think that you get this, you get this huge, huge gap. How I many of you saw the public agenda study that came out, uh, sort of likening uh, counselors to Homer Simpson, funded by the Gates Foundation? It's called "Can I Get a Little Advice Here?" And you know, kind of how an overstretched high school guidance system is undermining students' college aspirations. Kind of pretty incendiary stuff. See, it's so nice. Uh, see, this is an arena we need to work in because you don't have to go through peer review with this kind of thing. You can just go public. And if you, and how many of you actually looked at their methodology? You ought to go take a look at it because it's like uh, that. I, 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 Bluestein would throw it out. Would never allow that to be published. Okay. But how many of you, if you heard this slant on it, and this is from their own data. So what they said is part of the research analysis, we compared the responses of young people who said that their counselors see, seem to see them as just another face in the crowd with the responses of young people who said that their counselors really made an effort to get to know them and help them. Personalized education, school connectedness, forming a, a working alliance with a kid. Okay. Now, when they compare in their own data, and this was about split 50-50 because of how they actually uh, uh, asked the question. And from their own data, if you look, basically what they said, all the advantages were for the half of their sample that had a counselor who took the time to get to know them and work with them. So those people were more likely to go directly from high school to college. They were more likely to receive financial aid or scholarships to pay for college. They were more satisfied in their college choices. They were choosing their college based on its academic reputation and or financial offers made to them. And they felt that their college would help them to get a good job after graduating. So see, but so how many of you, you heard the report, but did you hear this, this important message? See, that's buried, that's like, that's not in the little, every, people, we, at this stage of the game, we Twitter and then we read the first page of an abstract and that's good enough and you don't look behind. But if you take a look behind, the real story, I think, it's, it's the idea of if you get effective counseling, good things happen. So there are real consequences for not getting effective counseling. Now, um, at the Center for School Counseling Outcome Research, we've done a number of studies, and I just want to share with you a little bit of data. We did a, a studies in six different states that was based on some work that I had done um, in Missouri. Uh, and so uh, Connecticut, Missouri, Nebraska, Rhode Island, Utah, Allen Burkhardt, and Wisconsin. Uh, and we're going to put that together in a special issue of professional school counseling. Uh, and um, I just wanted to share with you, um, this is what I was talking with uh, Steve Brown about. Um, so this is Connecticut data, okay? And in Connecticut data, what I want to talk about is the value added gain in predicting discipline incidents for Connecticut high school students. And I have enough data that I would argue that if you take a look at the percentage of uh, discipline rates and uh, discipline incidents and suspension rates in Connecticut high schools, Okay, uh, and, and see the red, the big red 23%, it's like, and you, this is gonna be intuitively obvious for you. As a, as a percentage of poor kids in schools goes up, what, what happens with discipline rates? They go up, okay? Uh, and that's like 23, if I can read that, 23%. Now, as the, per, as the number of dollars per kid increases, what happens to discipline rates? Goes down. So, and that's an additional 3% of the variance, okay? Uh, as enrollment size goes up in Connecticut high schools, discipline incidents go up as well. Okay. 
as r the ratio of students to counselor gets worse, discipline incidents also go up. And interesting enough, after removing all of that variance, so this is a hierarchical multiple regression. This is a, you know, if I wanted to give myself a better shot, I, I wouldn't have put it at the end, but I put uh, um, uh, college and career counseling at the end, and that added in an additional 4% of the variance, so that across Connecticut High School, as young people are having access to college and career counseling services, you can also say discipline incidents go down and suspension rates go down. Now, this is what I'm talking to Ed Clausey about, you know, what's the mechanism? I'd, I think it has to do with meaning, purpose, hope, satisfaction, you know, as a mediator of that. But it's clearly, uh, from the work that we're doing, there's good things that happen for kids when you're doing this kind of work. You see, it's kind of a nice little stepping stone here. As the ratio of counselor to kid gets worse, incidence rates go up. And if you look around, it's at the ASCA recommended ratio of 250 to 1. That's not a bad breaking point. And you start to see, and it's kind of as you start to see that, 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 go, that, that taking place. Now, the first part of the data I was talking about is really you know, self-report from counselors and, and others. But we've got a lot of data from principals. And actually, the principal data is always stronger because they're more discriminating. And that principals agree. Uh, and this is Connecticut data, that college and career counseling services are related to lower suspension rates, fewer discipline incidents, higher graduation rates, and better attendance. And, and I could show that that's, I can, uh, we'll talk about Chicago in a minute. But that's not an uncommon finding. We found that in Missouri as well. And, it, and that does go back to what Sue Whiston talks about, about school interventions and its connectedness to discipline incidents. That's I mean, that behavior in the school. Uh, I believe that's, that, that is... One of the things you've been arguing. Some additional findings from Connecticut um, that only half of, of the counselors were, of the schools are saying that college and career counseling involve collaboration with students and their parents to develop a four-year plan. So that's hit or missed, and I think it's related to has the resources. Uh, and the second thing, as ratios get worse, increase, school counselors do less college and career counseling. Okay. Um, this is data from Missouri that you can see the college and career counseling services individual planning, if you use an ASCA model, as a, as a percentage of minority kids increase in, in the Missouri high schools, those services go down. I, I, you know, I mean, this, I, I think this is something we really need to start paying attention to. We're doing a study currently in Massachusetts to uh, look at these very, these very issues. Okay. Um, I did a study um, with the Chicago Public Schools 130, there are 130, 140 high schools, all the different high schools. Uh, and, um, uh, and essentially looking at implementation of the comprehensive guidance program idea and then how it connects up. And um, um, let me I'll just talk about a couple of, of findings here. Uh, here's a canonical correlation. You see, the whole idea of counselors doing non-guidance tasks, you know, the doing paperwork, clerical kinds of things, uh, discipline, um, substitute teacher for the day, standing in the boys' room. Um, and, and anyone who works in schools will say, there's a lot of that that has to get done. And what we're arguing for is fair share. There's a certain percentage of your time, I think, as Jim was saying, you know, as a faculty, how much of your time actually goes to your research? You know, there's, everybody has to do some. But what we're finding is that this is inordinate. And a lot of counselors and principals are sort of colluding to say, we got these other problems and we don't want to do that. And what they're not doing is the college and career counseling side of things. But here you have, in the Chicago public schools, more non-guidance task counselors are doing less individual planning, college and career counseling. And what that's linked up to is lower uh, composite test scores. That's the, that's the Illinois State PSAE test, the composite test score, and fewer um, enrollment in advanced placement courses. Uh, we, I looked, you can look at it from a multiple regression point, and it says the same thing after you remove the uh, influence of free and reduced lunch. You find that non-guidance tasks are negatively associated with test scores, but individual planning, the college and career side of it, is positively associated with increased test scores. Same thing with enrollment in AP classes. Pretty important thing if you want to promote college readiness. Those kids that are going into honest to goodness AP classes, you know, and doing, and boy, and if they actually get three or higher, you know, that's a good predictor of, of, of what's going to be going on. Not a bad way to promote college and career readiness. 
Uh, what you find across the, uh, what we found across the Chicago high schools is that as you see the percentage of kids on free and reduced lunch in the high schools as it increases, you find it's almost like a straight line. It's like uh, uh, Steve and Nancy uh, Crane's, uh, you know, meta-analysis about, you know, you know, the components add in. You find that as the uh, uh, free and reduced lunch goes up, you find that the counselors are doing more and more non-guidance tasks. So the very kids who need it the most are getting the less. That's got to change. Okay. Now, here's from Chicago. Um, interesting. So we looked at what the principals were saying and what the, count and what, and what the counselors were saying. And see, it was very interesting. The green line, when both the principals are saying and the counselors are agreeing that college and career counseling, the individual planning work is going on in their schools, those schools, and, and it was interesting because there was a subset of them, and they were the special schools, and they were, I mean, they were from across the gamut. They weren't just the selective enrollment schools that, that Chicago has. But those schools, they had a higher percentage of students applying to three or more colleges, which was is an, an important outcome indicator for Chicago. Seniors leaving Chicago high schools take an exit uh, survey, and what they found is that if you can get young people to apply to three or more schools, they have much a greater likelihood of actually going to a college. So that's an, that's an important predictor. So, uh, so, so we found that when the, both sides were saying, yep, this is going on in our school, higher percentage uh, of uh, kids applying to three or more college, a higher percentage of, se of, of seniors saying they were actually accepted into a college they're really gonna go to, uh, and lower dropout rates. And you compare that to the blue line, that's where the, where the principal is saying, we're not doing that, and the, and, the, and the counselors and principals are both agreeing, they're not doing that. So it has consequences. It's not just not a nice thing to do, it's actually something that has a demonstrable, measurable impact uh, for kids. Okay. Um, the transition from eighth to ninth grade in the school district that this young woman I was telling you about goes to, they lose almost 50% of their dropout is actually from eighth to ninth grade transition. It, it, it's remarkable. Um, now, one of the things that they've instituted, actually, and that came, actually, and that thinking is down in Washington as well, Greg Darnier that we had here in Massachusetts uh, last year for Race to the Top. So Joyce Brown, who's the head of guidance for um, Chicago for many years, uh, uh, championed this 12-touch program. And essentially, it was the goal to establish a personal relationship with each young person to help them feel that they are wanted, that they belong, are known and connected to their high schools. Now, um, so think about, we're talking about, Sue was talking about, well, what common elements of effective counseling interventions. Here, in the data I could show you, here were four of the most important effective program elements. Establishing a personal relationship with each student, both while they are in eighth grade and when they are in their first year of high school, ninth grade. Okay, met with students and parents and guardians before ninth grade started during the summer. Okay? Held face-to-face -face enrollment meetings with parents and students and discussed four-year educational and college-going career plan. And then they provided each ninth grader a small group advisory support period that lasted at least 10 weeks. Okay, that's not too shabby. That's time intensive. That costs money too. See, so, yeah, I mean, uh, and I, I, I mean, I'm not sure which, and, and Joyce has never read uh, any of our work, and, uh, and I was looking and saying, well, gee, I think she kind of hits most of what uh, Steve talks about, you know, because you know, really the relationship and the support being, the, being some of the most powerful ones. Um, that was the one, this program was the one predictor around promoting a college-going climate in the, in the Chicago high schools and those schools that were more likely to have significantly more of their kids um, applying to three or more colleges. Yeah. So again, setting a climate so that there, and this is people who are engaged in serious reform in schools are saying, no, once you start changing the environment around, you begin to find some, some very good things that are happening. Um, we don't have time, but I could certainly show you a lot of data from Utah that would uh, argue the same thing, from Rhode Island, uh, uh, from Nebraska, um, you know, so very different uh, places, but finding very similar results. Now, um, what I want to do is, 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 this is something I'm going to be presenting at the ASCA conference next year, um, and I kind of titled it, Draw the Line, Stand Tall to Protect Students. And I, this is very important. What's the best protective factor? Uh, the Center for Disease Control identified as what? School connectedness, right? And, and you know, does, does some, do the, does, are there adults, are there people in the school who care about me, care about my learning, and want to get to know me? Okay, very important. 
This is a school or, um, district. What you're seeing is a sample of eight, about 8,000 junior high school and high school students okay, across 25 different schools in this one particular district who've done a lot of work to implement the comprehensive model idea. And what you find is some very, some very interesting things. That in low-risk schools, that would be where they have fewer kids on free and reduced lunch, they have, th this is a district that has really bad mobility rates. I mean, you know, so they've got a lot of kids moving in and out and a very poor predictor of, of academic success, uh, as well as English language proficiency. So, um, so low-risk schools, they would have a lot less of this, and then high-risk schools obviously would have a lot more. Well, if you take a look, the, the students in the low-risk schools or the students in the high-risk schools are saying, we don't feel as safe in our schools. And you, and you can begin to see their perceptions of safety. I'm not feeling safe in my school. What does that do with learning? Is one thing that comes to mind. But what's interesting is the yellow line is in both of the schools, because I think of the program that they have, the counselors are meeting equally with both. Not unlike Chicago, they're meeting equally regardless of the school type. Okay? And what you find is the red line that the students are saying that counselors are more responsive to my needs at that point in those schools. So um, here's a hierarchical linear modeling uh, that we did that we're, we're in the process of writing up, but there are three hypotheses. So that risk factor schools, kid, or schools that have uh, poorer kids, uh, the English language is a, is a big issue of mobility rates. In those schools, that's going to be a direct predictor of uh, student indicators of success, which would be not being connected to school, not feeling safe. Uh, and we found that. We also found that the second hypothesis, age two, that counselors, when they're meeting with kids in the, and they're being more responsive to their needs, that is a nice little predictor of connectedness and success. But H3 is, I think, most fascinating, and this is kind of the e-portfolio study uh, I'm going to try to talk to Scott into doing, that if you, um, uh, in, if you um, have counselors who are more responsive to student needs, that acts as a protective factor that disrupts the relationship between risk factor and student indicators of success. And that'll be an interaction effect. Ju actually, Julia Bryant from Maryland found the same thing in a national data set. It's kind of embedded uh, uh, in her study. Uh, see, this is a closing the gap kind of argument, because you could say, well, what's the correlation between um, risk factor scores and student indicators of success across different schools? Well, maybe it's 0.5, let's just say. But what if you, you said, well, but when you start to implement effective college and career counseling services, that goes down to 0.42 or 0.38. So that, you know, I, I think given the difficulties that young people face in, in our world, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to, you know, to deal with this is a school district that has gang problems. Last year started off, a young person was knifed in the parking lot and died. Two weeks later, they had a retaliation attack. You know, you're not, I mean, you, there's limits in terms of the, what these people, are, what these counselors and teachers are up against. But you can begin to say, how do we hone our impact to begin to lessen that relationship and push, and that's what I'm talking about, protective factors, pushing it back. Okay. Um, being a data person, John Crumbles, this is my pre-post. So the, um, I wish you could meet this. This is a counselor, a um, um, junior high school counselor uh, who you'll never meet, um, uh, a terrific human being. One of the things that she does in her schools, because I'm sitting here thinking, well, this is nice, but uh, you know, it's like, does it, is, it, is the data accurate? And I'm sort of snooping around. And uh, so I started interviewing the counselors and talking with them. And so this one counselor in their highest risk school, and which is the school where the, the kids are saying the counselors are more responsive to my needs. One of the things she does, just one of the things she does, is that she has these big plastic tubs. And, uh, and, and uh, she goes around to uh, you know, Goodwill and uh, her friends, and she's got a network where she collects clothes during the year. Okay? And a couple of times a year, she lays them out, and she has parent nights, so when the parents come in. So this is a district where it gets very cold, uh, winter, snow, all of that. Kids show up in flip-flops. They don't have warm coats. You know, it's the United States. Okay? So, and here's, so this is a pre, and then this is after. See, the difference after. Do you get a sense of the need and the urgency? I mean, these are not saying, oh, I think I would like this. This is people in need who are needing help. So what I want to say to you is that when you more 
effectively implement, in which uh, Jim was saying is like, you know, go from theory to implementation. Implementation is obviously the difficult part. But you can help, this is a positive message. So what we're talking about will work. You can help kids to be connected, engaged, safe, and goal-directed. If you don't have gaps across the school districts, you have high expectations, no variability away from excellence. Now, in the last, so, you know, why don't you all tell me how many Da Vinci Code, I have Da Vinci Code lovers? Okay, now help me with this, okay? There's power and treasure here. Uh, CTE, SYD, PV, come on now, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds. I want you, to, come on. Anybody see patterns? Who said that? Right you are. ESE, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Okay. They have a vested interest don't, I mean, in getting behind this because they've got, so again, they've got problems. Probably the most at-risk job in the world is a high school principal in some ways, um, or principals, but the Department of Elementary, they're struggling to find ways to, to, to have this stuff be effective. How about the uh, National Association of Secondary School Principals? How about the American School Counseling Association? How about the American Counseling Association? about the American Psychological Association. And look, you can put APA and ACA together and the, it doesn't burst into flames. <laughs> <laughs> NCDA, uh, Society SVB, uh, DYS. So we, we've done a lot of work in the last couple of years with Division of Youth Services. Um, it's the same thing. What they want to do, and they're, we're implementing an Empower Your Future, it, it's a career development curriculum. Uh, and it's like, Positive futures, way better way to go. And, and then I would say ETC for et cetera, because um, um, I can't even, um, EL, what was that, ELG? PN. PN, that's right. So we've got lots of things. So you know, we all ought to be able to write a letter to these people and say, I, at one point or another, I've paid money to most of these associations. I maybe should be able to say, could I get some back if you can't come together to form a common message that we can go to Washington and say, come on now. This is important. This works. Okay. So in summary, um, we need a national policy for sure. And we need to spell it out. We need to implement it and evaluate it. What are the outcomes? Uh, as well as um, and how do we, and, and we want to continually improve it and make it better. That, that, this is what this is all about. And then stay the course. So there's three recommendations I would make. First of all, we need to say, be very clear about what are exemplary college and career counseling services in a pre-K through 16 model? You know, because I, I don't get, from a, my counseling psychology background, I, I don't see a, really any difference between the college, you know, the, in, the, in the kindergarten side of things. You know, we're talking about where do expectations start? Well, they don't start in college, that, that's for sure. Where do efficacy expectations, where do, where do you learn those things? Where do they come online? What, I would say though, now here's a danger. Exemplary career services is, is not, uh, and, and, and I have a great deal of respect for the trait and factor approach, but it's not a trait and factor approach. It, it's not, because, and why I want to be negative about that is that because that fits too nicely with a computer paradigm. Because you can take a couple of a quick 15 item inter, inventory and they'll schedule, and they'll tell you everything you want to know about yourself. And, and because it matches up. I mean, this is a huge issue. If you look at Naviance, Career Cruising, uh, my plan for college that Massachusetts comes out with, and I'm actually, actually we're in process now of trying to interface with them around the psychometrics of the assessments and all uh, that they're doing. This is, a huge, this is a huge issue, but what is it? What should third graders get? Um, if, we, if you're interested, actually I'm meeting tomorrow with the language arts coordinator and a counselor at the school of the young woman and what we're talking about is a parent intervention in a positive way around the reading, positive college experience, and then helping them with the reading resources that, that they actually have in the district, but they don't manage to be able to, to connect up. Um, uh, so what, 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 is the, what is the paradigm for, what's the best way to do eighth to ninth grade transition in planning? The e-portfolio, I mean, th these, this is the critical uh, part of our work. The second thing is, what are the qualifications for who delivers exemplary practice and what are the ratios at different levels? So what are the qualifications? I mean, I, I'm gonna say I want someone working with my kid who's at the least a fully trained and competent counselor 
at least. In message, but see, but budgets being what they are, what, what you're likely to get is in Massachusetts, well, it's, uh, they're now trying to push a bill through to hire graduation coaches, which will likely be more of a minimum wage kind of a job. Uh, and, 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 so gonna pull, and, and it's not to say we need to get more people in there, but well, this is work not everybody can do. This is a highly trained skill. Uh, and a profession that you need good training in. And I think we need to fight for that. And, and, and regardless of the money, it's at least worth the, the MX missile uh, uh, idea. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say is, and I can't believe I'm saying this, and maybe this is my mental health after being four years as a department chair, uh, what are the job descriptions and the sophisticated evaluation processes to make sure exemplary services are provided to all students across a developmental spectrum? Uh, in Massachusetts, we're now um, really, uh, it's very exciting because we actually have a very hard-hitting um, evaluation for counselors to be evaluated on. Up to now, uh, a counselor would go in for an evaluation and they'd take the teacher form out and say, well, how's your classroom instruction going? And, you know, it's completely, and that, that's kind of, but see here, now we're saying here's the job description if, if, that flows from uh, the Massachusetts model, and here's the evaluation piece to that. So how much of your counselor's time is being spent doing clerical activities or scheduling? How, mu how, how often are they going into classrooms or meeting with parents or doing uh, the career interventions? So the positive side of this, and this is what I'll finish, is that these are things that, that are, these are the valuable factors. I mean, and, and, and these are things that lead to better outcomes for students. And, uh, and, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. I look forward to your questions afterwards. So thank you.